Hello, and welcome to episode 30 of Charlotte Mecklenburg History with Dan Morrill. Today is Sunday, October 11th, 2020, and I am Dan's daughter, Mary Dana, joining my dad, Dan, through Zoom. Hey, Dad. Hey, everybody. Hey, I'm here. Hey, Don't right. worry about this clock that's behind me. Mary Dana's going to get it fixed for me for Christmas. It's not working right now, so don't worry about the time. Oh, well, now I'm now I'm committed. You're committed. <laughs> okay. You notice I did ask you before we started, though. I did. So that's fine. Yeah, I will. Yeah, yeah. We, it's good for you to have a working clock. So and I know when this is 30 episodes, it's, I can't believe it. So it's been fun to do. And uh, if you're joining us for the first time, my dad is a retired UNCC history professor, is a local historian, and uh, he is the recipient of many awards including he's in the order of the longleaf pine that's a that's a good one dad i'm proud it of you. is it is i'm just uh, i'm just so grateful to you know people that put me up for it. it was very nice so thanks everybody for joining us today this is part two of our fourth ward podcast and today my dad said he's gonna go uh kind of give a tour of fourth ward this week so i'll let you take over dad well let me say first of all not notice at the bottom is a st statement that says for all 30 sessions go to we preserve mecklenburg.org forward slash episodes because i'm going to take a little bit of break i think 30 is a good time to take a break i've been doing this i guess we started in what January or February, I think it was February we started, maybe March. Yeah, I, I think it was February, I can't but, remember. But um, you know, I'll be back. The next one I'm going to do, I'm going to do it on hospitals and medical care, which everybody can identify with. So, Are you going to take a couple of weeks soon. off? Is that yeah, your yeah idea? it'll be a couple of weeks. I, I'll probably be doing a little bit of research and background on that because I know some of it, but I don't know as much as I ought to. So I'm going to do that. So okay, and you remember, can you can look you you can see all and listen to all the podcasts. They're all listed on wepreservemecklenburg.org forward slash episode. So and people can friend you on Facebook if they want to. That's exactly right, Mary Dana. Let me know when I'm at 25 minutes because oh, okay. I, I, I need to try to get done with this thing. Okay. Oh, all right. Go ahead. Well, look, I, I'm going to start out with what we talked about last time about Fourth Ward. And, you know, one of the things that I believe should be done before you ever tear anything down is to know its history. And a lot of what I'm going to be talking to you about today is about the older residences that survive in Fourth Ward. And not only residences, they're also two institutional buildings as well. And they can teach us so much about the history of Charlotte. And imagine that if Mr. Odell had had his way, all of these residences would have been destroyed and we would not have the artifacts to be able to teach history. And we would have had the gleaming modern city is what he labeled his master plan that was released in August of 1965. So happily that didn't happen and we talked about the whole preservation mentality. Now you know Mary Dana and all of you that have looked at these podcasts, you know that I like to start with the big picture and the reality is that Charlotte was going through a boom period in the 1880s and 1890s. And there were several things that contributed to that. And I want to at least give reference to three of them before I start looking at the houses, because you're going to see that a lot of these people, some of these people come from the north. One comes from New York State, one comes from Pennsylvania. There were a lot of new people coming to town, a lot of new money, a lot of new energy, a lot of growth. One of them had to do with the fact that Charlotte had excellent railroad connections, and especially it got a very important railroad connection in the 1870s. And that was a new major railroad built 
from Charlotte to Atlanta going north and it hooked in with the North Carolina Railroad here and ended up going to Washington, D.C. And Mary Dana, you have lived at two places on that railroad, Belmont and Easley. They're mm -hmm. both on the same railroad. And that was, that was um, among its early names, it went through various configurations, was the Charlotte and Atlanta Airline Railroad. Now, there weren't any airplanes in 1877 when this timetable came out. So there didn't want any confusion and they'd call a real fast railroad an airline, like it was just flying down the track. So it wasn't a plane, it was a train, but that's what it was. Now notice, this might seem like a long time, but remember this was 1877. This, this route went into effect on June 10th, 1877. You left Atlanta at four in the afternoon and you got into Charlotte sh shortly after 4 a.m. in the morning. So that's about a 12 hour ride. Well, remember before the railroad, the first half of the 19th century, it took five and a half days to go from Charlotte to Raleigh. So 12 hours was a revolution, mm -hmm. an enormous revolution. And this really did open up Charlotte for a tremendous period of growth, this new railroad that opened in the 1870s. So Mayor Dana, when you go to Belmont and look at your old house, just think about that, because that was a very, and these, these images, you can see what a train looked like in the 1870s on, on the timetable, and you can see them on the left as well. Of course, they were all steam engines. You can imagine what your son would do if he'd been two years old and he'd gone up and the steam engine came by with you know, the smoke billowing out and God knows what was going on. <laughs> now, the thing, the other thing that that railroad made possible and which brought so much money was the growth of the cotton industry. Now, the first cotton mill, the building's still there and it's right on the railroad. And that's why it was built, was the Charlotte Cotton Mills, which opened in 1881. It's at North Graham and uh, West Fifth Street. And that building is still there. That was the first cotton mill. So clearly, Charlotte was going, it was beginning to get a whole new process and aspect of economic growth in the 1880s and 1890s. Big expansion of the population. What's that and building that's used for now? That it's, a, it, it's an adaptive reuse. It's largely used for offices. Okay. But uh, it's a it's a it's a it's a great building, and I'm glad it's there. Now I have mentioned this man before. I'm going to ask you a question, Mary Dana. Uh -oh. you, do you remember where he went to school? No. Daniel Augusta <laughs> Rensselaer oh. Polytechnic Institute. Oh yeah. We talked about him when we did No <laughs> Doc, and I went back to it when we went through Dilworth, and you still didn't remember where he went to school. <laughs> Well, that Tompkins, street, I, I do know I that street down, was named for him. I put Tompkins moved here in 1883. And I said Tompkins believed in a new South of industry and diversified agriculture. And what Tompkins brought was a cheerleader. I don't want to get political. I'm not political at all. And I wouldn't put, uh, quite frankly, D.A. Tompkins in this category. But he was a lot like Donald Trump. You know, he's a big cheerleader, very optimistic, very much a boosterism. And he established really was fundamental in establishing the School of Textiles at North Carolina State and also at Clemson because he was originally from South Carolina. And he really picked Charlotte to come to because it was strategically located between the two Carolinas. And there's Tompkins Hall, which he really paid for and designed, which is still in use on the campus of North Carolina State, even though it was built right at the turn of the last century. And you remember his book, Cotton Mills Commercial Features, mm -hmm. where he basically instructed people how to build textile mills, including mill houses. You remember those mill houses that we talked about in North Charlotte. Uh, so yes. you've got a cheerleader, you've already got a textile mill, 
And Mary Dana, if you were not on a railroad, you were in the 18th century. You know, if you were not on the railroad, you were in the 18th century. And even when you got to Charlotte, the fastest thing in town in 1883 was a horse. I mean, the, you know, streetcars don't come until 1891, at least trolleys, electric streetcars. And, you know, so it's it, railroads, everything. Railroads, everything. You got to be on a railroad. And Charlotte was on a lot of railroads and its excellent rail connections really helped. Now, where you're going to start the tour is at 129 North Poplar Street. An easy way to get there is go west on Trade Street from the square and take your second right. That'll put you on Poplar Street. Go one block and you'll see this house on your left. Now, this is the only residence that we're going to see that's built of brick. Now, that right up tells you it cost a lot of money. This was a very, very expensive house that was built in 1895. Like so many of these houses, it's get, it, it gets its name as the Bagley Mullen House, and it's very much a Victorian house because remember, the thing that Victorian architecture venerated was complexity and industrialization. To say something that was handmade was considered a bad thing. You didn't want that was old fashioned. They wanted new, elaborate, very dynamic houses. And the man who came here and who first bought this house was Andrew Bagley. And guess who what he was? He was a railroad official. So the railroad was not only attracting industry, it was attacking, uh, attracting a lot of employment as well. A great story. I remember when I first came across this, it was wonderful. You know, it was bought in 1897 by a man who uh, came from elsewhere in North Carolina. I think he was originally from Elizabeth City, as I remember. His name was W.N. Mullen. He actually died in the house in February 1910. He came as a grocer. We're going to see one more grocery. We're going to see a grocery store on our tour. Because neighborhood grocery stores were very important because it was a walking scale city. Because once you got off that train, fastest thing was a horse. But he really made a lot of money because he came up with a concoction, a liniment, something you could rub on you. Ooh, ooh. And he called it Hornet's Nest Liniment. Now, Hornet's Nest, of course, that's an old term for Charlotte, mm -hmm. Mecklenburg County, going back to the Revolutionary War. And, you know, there wasn't any uh, federal uh, food and drug administration. There was nobody controlled. God, you could put together anything, usually something that had a lot of alcohol in it. But, <laughs> you know, there were all these medicine people going around peddling all this stuff. And that's how Mr. Mullen makes his money, which I've always thought was great. But if you didn't get cured by Mr. Uh, Mullen's liniment, you see he got these people to certify this guy who lived in Charlotte, Mr. Guthrie, said, this certifies that I have used the medicine named Hornet's Nest Liniment sold by Mr. W.N. Mullen, and I'm satisfied that it has real worth. I can rec recommend it as a good remedy. will do what it's claimed for it. So you ate, you have a pain, rub that stuff on you, ooh, it's really good. But if it didn't work, you had somewhere else to go. Now, this is a great, great story. This is just one block down on your left on Poplar Street, 229 North Poplar Street. This is now condominiums. And by the way, the uh, Bagley Mullen House, Mary Dan, I don't know what it's used for. I know it was an insurance office for a long time, but I think it's been changed. Now, you know, when you think about women in Charlotte's history, um, and I think I, I think Smedberg should be U U R G Jane Renwick Smedberg Wilkes. I think it's a U rather than an E. So please excuse me for that. There's a statue of her down near Carolina's Medical Center on the Little Sugar Creek Greenway, oh. and she is uh, 
I would say one of the two most important women in all, all of Charlotte's history. She came here because she got married. She was from New York City. She married a fellow named Wilkes, came here in 1854. She was here during the Civil War. Charlotte was a massive place for human suffering during the Civil War, particularly because it was one of the last places to fall. And they'd bring all these ghastly wounded soldiers in here by railroad. She, how, she saw how much suffering there was. She also was a was an Episcopalian. Now I grew up in the Episcopal Church, and I'm very proud of the fact that I was in the Episcopal Church because the Episcopal Church has done a lot of good. And there was a minister. I didn't put his name up here, but his name was Bronson, B R O N S O N. And he was a really inspiring minister. And in the 1870s. And by the way, he would go on to be the one that really led to the establishment of the Thompson Orphanage. And that ought to be something I ought to do something mm -hmm. like sometime. Yeah, definitely. But he, in a sermon, said that Charlotte needed to have a hospital. Charlotte had no hospitals. There were very few hospitals in the country. Hospitals were temporary things that basically were established during war. And after the war ended, they just do away with them. And a lot of people didn't like to have hospitals around because they were full of germs and thought that's just where people went to die. Well, Bronson said we need to have a permanent hospital in Charlotte. And this, of course, hospital, which opened in 1878, 229 North Poplar Street was named St. Peter's Hospital because it indeed was really the inspiration came from St. Peter's Episcopal Church. And Jane Renwick's Meg Berg Wilkes, really smart woman, she was basically a member, well, she was a member of the church, and he essentially, Bronson, the minister, put her in charge of raising the money and putting the organization together. And this woman really did dedicate herself to that effort. Now, the hospital has gone through various changes. The two pictures on the right are obviously not the hospital as it exists today. They, they expanded it and it didn't, they didn't tear it down as much as they just expanded it. Lewis Asbury, whom we've mentioned before, mm -hmm. was the architect of the final expansion in 1922. But of course, in 1940, the hospital closed. She also, Jane Renwick Smedberg Wilkes, she also established the Good Samaritan Hospital, which is was located where the the um, Bank of America Stadium now is, where they play football. And it was for African Americans. Obviously, those were the days of legal race, racial segregation. And Jane Renwick Smedberg Wilkes had to work within that context. But the hospital, St. Peter's, closed in 1940 and went to Charlotte, became Charlotte Memorial Hospital, which of course morphed into Carolina's Medical Center, which of course morphed again into Atrium Health. And you might have seen, just as we're doing this podcast, there's an article in the paper today that Wake Forest University, I'm a graduate of Wake Forest, is joining with Atrium to establish a medical school in Charlotte. And I think that is terrific, although we're going to see it as forerunner here in a moment. So that's an important aspect of the growing complexity of the, the, of, of the community. Now you're going to go up Poplar Street and you're going to turn left on 8th Street and you're going to come to this little house here, which is now as the city was growing, as more people were coming, obviously there was more demand for housing. And Fourth Ward expands northward more and more lots become filled in with houses. And one of the things, of course, that we want to know is when exactly was this house built? 
Now, there's there's a key here I want to show you. This is, you see the black arrow? Mm -hmm. this, is, this is, I showed you this map before, but I had to make it real big and it was really lousy. This is the Beers map of 1877. And the black arrow shows the lot where the Sloan Davidson house, named for early owners, the Sloan Davidson house it is. Well, you can see in 1877, it wasn't there. Mm -hmm. It was not there. So we know this house was built after 1877. Now this house is very typical of good, solid, slightly upper middle class housing that was built in resident residential areas of Charlotte. You not only see it in Fourth Ward, you also see it and saw it in uh, neighborhoods like Dilworth, that very oldest section of Dilworth that we looked at when we were doing that podcast. Mm -hmm. The thing that, of course, it's a frame, frame house. All the houses that you're going to see from now on are frame houses. We saw the one brick house, the Bagley Mullen house, the one where the guy rubbed the liniment on you and you got well. Yeah. <laughs> and of course, the institutional building, that was, um, that was obviously brick because it was a hospital. Mm -hmm. but, but all the houses are, are, are wooden houses. Now, one of the things that the railroad allowed was to have building materials shipped in. You know, if you go back before the Civil War, workmen basically have to make all the material for the house on site. I mean, or they have to make it in a very nearby location. They can't ship stuff. But Lordy me, with the railroad, that if you could get from um, Charlotte to Atlanta in 12 hours, you, you could also get from Charlotte to Washington, D.C. in 13 hours, 14 hours. And we're talking about 1877. And of course, passenger trains were very important, but so were freight trains. Mm -hmm. So most of this trim, you know, see all that fancy stuff up there in the gable ends. And yeah. You see all the balustrade and these turn, all that, what we call filigree. All this was, this, this would have been made in New York City somewhere and would have okay. been shipped in by rail. And this is a, what would be called a Queen Anne, Queen Anne house. It's a folk Victorian. Now, folk Victorian means, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't out of a copy book. It was just a local builder that put it together, got this stuff. He might have bought a plan from a magazine, gotten a plan. But it's it's, it's a folk Victorian house. Means it means that it's very typical of the community in which it's built. Built, and this real fancy stuff is clearly puts it within what's called the Queen Anne style, which was not not like Queen Anne in furniture, but which was very much a style that really celebrated industrial production of woodwork and depended primarily upon the, uh, me the mechanical lathe and the scroll saw. You know, that's what this is. Now we just go right down next house on the right. This is 326 West 8th Street. This is the overcarge house. Now I'm going to show you something here. I, I, before I do, I want you to look at this arrow. I don't know for sure, but I know what I've heard. I've heard that this predates the rest of the house. This little part here. Mm -hmm. And then it goes way back. I mean, it, it, this, this would have been a, a, even a pre-Civil War cottage. And this, but clearly the house, the Overcarge house, which is named for a Methodist minister who moved here in 1869 and he's buried in Elmwood Cemetery. You know, going down to Elmwood Cemetery, you're going to see all these people. You're going to see Edward Dilworth Lattice's grave. You know, you're going to see E.C. Griffith's grave. You're going to see Elias Overgaard's grave. He was a Methodist minister. And there By was the way, you've been talking about 25 minutes. Oh my God. Well, I've got to go. 
All right, now let's look at the map. Now remember this this was the one house see that there is a house there in eighteen seventy seven. And yes, you see that little I see that. Off the east end. Mm -hmm. That might that might be that that was there before and they added all the rest on it. So that's an issue. Now, what you're going to do, you've gone down 8th Street, you're going to turn right on Pine Street, you're going to go up to the next corner, okay? Here's the overcar shed. Now, this one is, this, this is a little bit of a mystery, no doubt about it. A walking scale city, I talked about the fact that grocery stores were very, very important. You know, people ask questions, well, why did they have a grocery store right there? Well, you, they didn't have cars. There weren't any automobiles when this was built. Did you hear that, Mary Dana? I did. No automobiles. Mary Dana, what's the fastest thing in town? It's a horse. A horse. Well, <laughs> I'll, I'll give them. By, by 1897, they'd get on a streetcar. But still, you know, once you got off that train, man, now you're, you're walking. Sitting, you're so and now, uh, you know they they so the, a busy bee boneless breakfast. They didn't they didn't, you didn't eat there. People lived upstairs, and the store was downstairs. Now, I really need to do more research on this that I didn't have time to do. I know that a Mr. Crowell was the first operator. I know Mr. Berryhill, who lived in the Berryhill house that we'll talk about next also bought it and operated it. I'm just not exactly sure what whether Mr. Crowell owned it himself, whether he worked for another out outfit called the Star Mills, but it doesn't make any difference. Now, if you take this tour, which you can do by driving or you can do by walking, you, this would be a great place to eat because mm -hmm. this is now Alexander Michaels. Now let's look, now here, see the blue air? See yeah. what I'm doing, I've added, there's the first one, there's the second one, Overcars. 1877, was there anything on that lot? I, I don't see anything. No, nothing <laughs> there. So we know it's after 1877. Okay. And indeed the deeds indicate is 1897. Great historic artifact. Now, see all this wonderful history that you, you know, you can go buy pork and sausage, you know, you can, you, you, it's at Ninth and Pine Street. You know, you, it's run by Mr. Crowell. You can go, you know, they, they just sell all kinds of stuff, you know, uh, sell overstock on um, Hecker's Oat. Well, whatever. So, but, and there you see them standing in front of the store. And, you know, people really used to pose for photographs in those days because there weren't many cameras around. Taking yeah. pictures is a big deal. Not a big deal anymore. You just take your phone out and go click, 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 take a picture. <laughs> All right, now this one. This is the Newcomb Bear Hill house. Now, the guy, that, first of all, look here. Mrs. John Newcomb has departed Brook, uh, for Brooklyn, New York, where she expects to spend a month among her friends and relatives. These people were from White Plains, New York. Now, one of the big things with D.A. Tompkins was they didn't care where you're from as long as you could help make the city grow economically. And you know how she got, now this was in the paper in 1885. House was built in 1884. That's when this house was built. And of course, my goodness gracious, I mean, it's just a uh, testimonial to filigree, testimonial to ornate woodwork. And with that big pyramidal roof on top, and my, that's a grand mansion. That was considered a mansion. And also, it's very interesting. This article from September 4th, 1887, notes that Mr. John Newcomb and his brother established a bellows factory. Now, people don't think that much about bellows, you know, they never think, but bellows are very important, particularly for any work with metal foundries and of course textile mills needed a lot of foundry work they needed a lot of machinery and so that was what was attracting people here see most people go to live 
where they can indeed make a living. Now here you see, started with Sloan Davidson, went to the overcars. Here's where the uh, crowd book Bear Hill story is. And you can see in 1877, there's nothing. And you can see it's fairly sparse up here. Mm -hmm. It's fairly sparse, but it really gets filled in. Now, again, what does the artifact teach you? And you see, you know what Dooley O'Dell thought about this? It was a dump. <laughs> yes, I know. It was a dump. You want to put up a high-rise building. Okay? I mean, it's... Yeah, and tear it down. Right. It's arrogance. It's arrogance. But now, as you have the artifact, you can teach all this wonderful history. Now, the next one is the Young Morrison House. And I purposely put in here the um, Sanborn Insurance map, which um, does indeed, uh, as a wonderful source. This is from 1911. And you can see a couple of things here are interesting. Obviously, the house is there, right? Mm -hmm. There's a house there. And you can see by 1911, this is just absolutely full of houses, big houses, important houses. And here is the Young Morrison House. Now the Young Morrison House is a, a, a very, very interesting house in itself. It, we don't know the exact date that it was built, but we know it was built after 1877. How do we know? Because the Brown era points to where the Young Morrison House is located. And I'm sorry, the Yellow era up here. This one. Mm -hmm. That's it. Brown era is the It's a very old house. Yeah. Yep. So you're up here. Now, what you have to do, it gets a little tricky. This doesn't go all the way through anymore. When you, If you're taking the tour, you go up here, and there's a thing called Hackberry Place bunch of new places you kind of hook over here you come up here to poplar street take a left and you, you can go up to the young marsh house and by the way this street was wide from the very beginning it goes way back in 1877 you can see that 10th street was wide and i think that was partly because it was seen as being a very they wanted to make it a very special part of town now the interesting thing about, um, you know, the and I say the median at 10th Street, that was unique in um, Fourth Ward. I will say one thing that the the woman who who bought this house, her name was Young, I mean Morrison, excuse me. She by marriage was the great granddaughter by marriage, she was the great granddaughter of the first president of Davidson College. So these were significant people. And the man who first bought it was from, uh, he was he basically worked for the post office. Now, obviously the mail was very much tied to the railroad. Most, most mail, mail was delivered largely by railroad. So if you had excellent railroad connections, you were going to have a big a big post office now there's the wonder right across the street from the young morrison house there you are mr odell Woo! Woo! that's what you wanted for all of fourth ward can you imagine what you could learn by looking at that well 1969 the housing authority put it up and god knows i'm glad it didn't have a chance to put up anymore uh, Things terrible. Okay, now, how many minutes are we? Oh well, you're coming up on thirty-five. You've been talking. Okay, well I can make it. Okay. This is a great house. This is the other place to eat if you want to do the tour. This is five eleven North Church Street. I don't have a map for this one. This is uh, an elegant restaurant. You, it, it's not cheap. What's it In called? In fact, it's expensive. It's called uh, the McNancy House. Now, it was built by a man named Vinton Liddell. Now, there's a street up off North Tryon called Liddell Street where he had a big foundry. I bet he used bellows that he acquired from the Newcomb brothers. 
in his, <laughs> in his family. And he uh, he's right down Vinton Liddell's down there in Elmwood Cemetery. Lord knows they're all down there in Elmwood. And he came from Pennsylvania. He was from Erie, Pennsylvania. And it is a wonderful shingled style Victorian house. This is an unbelievable house. Listed in the National Register of Historic Places. I mean, this, this if you want to have a fine meal, call the McNich house, go and have a fine meal. And it is truly an exquisite place to eat. Now, the mayor of Charlotte was Samuel McNich, the brother of Frank McNich, whose house we talked about out on Sharon Lane. Mm -hmm. He lived in the house uh, and bought it from Mr. Liddell. And President William Howard Taft, the most obese man ever to be president of the United States, I think he weighed 350 pounds. I know he weighed over 300 pounds. They said he, had, he was a big golfer, and he had a lot of trouble seeing the ball before he hit it because he couldn't see it because of his belly. But he actually <laughs> visited in the house. And this does show how much money was being made, and it was largely through manufacturing. Now, you're going to, this is the last one. You're going to continue down Church Street because 511 Church Street is where the McNinch house was located. And you're going to go straight south on Church Street and you will uh, have to look at the Mecklenburg, I mean, the North Carolina Medical College building. Now, the North Carolina Medical College building is a very, very important structure itself. I mean, it's a very, very significant and important structure. And it'll be right in front of you. The North Carolina Medical College moved from Davidson to Charlotte in October 1907. And I put up here a sermon that was delivered at one of the graduations for the North Carolina Medical College. The architect of the building was uh, James J.M. McMichael. Now you might remember McMichael he did a lot of churches, and we talked about, for instance, we talked about Myers Park Presbyterian Church in uh, Myers Park, which uh, J.M. McMichael did. He also did this building. The school closed in 1914 when officials considered improvements suggested by the Carnegie Foundation would be too expensive. So it didn't last long. No, but it was here Seven and it years. did graduate and the sermon was at the at the graduation. So let me go way back and make my pitch and then I'm going to shut up. What's that building being used for now? The medical college. Uh, it's condominiums. OK, it, it, just as a hospital. is. Same. OK. Same. All right. Uh, remember, folks why I believe so much in preserving these places is their artifacts. I could not teach you this history if we didn't have these places preserved. When you couldn't go see them. You couldn't see them. Now, folks, I know some of you, I know, please, 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 come on, be a supporter of Preserve Mecklenburg. I am going to take a couple of weeks off I'll be back, but you can send your tax deductible online secure donation to preservemecklenburg.org forward slash donate. You want to send a check, make it to Preserve Mecklenburg and send it to Preserve Mecklenburg. A lot of you have watched these podcasts and you've not decided to be a supporter. And that's your, that's your privilege, but it would mean a lot if you would. So Mary Dana? How am I time on? Okay, good. You did a good job. And you can also email my dad at Dan Morrill, the number two, at gmail.com. And you can also let me say one other thing. If people have thoughts about what they'd like for me to do podcasts on, uh, send me an email. Now, you know, there are a lot of things I don't know that much about. So that's okay. I'm, I'm not going to guarantee I do it, but I'd love for you to let me. What would you like to know? My next one, as I say, is going to be on hospitals and medicine. We might even mention 
the hornet's nest liniment. Uh, well, yeah, I was I was actually going to say that too. I was going to say, please email my dad and let him know what you'd be interested in hearing about. So thanks for being with us today. And we will look forward to seeing you in a few weeks. Bye. Bye. bye, bye.